Hello and welcome to Mama's Aid's Tribute to Mother event for World Maternal Mental Health Day. I'm Ali Graves and I'm your host. I'm a group psychotherapist and counsellor at Mama's Aid, which is a charity that supports maternal mental health. At Mama's Aid, we love talking about motherhood, acknowledging the different journeys into motherhood and through motherhood, dispelling myths, breaking down barriers, building mums up and building connections. This, this event is an opportunity for us to come together and share stories of our experience. It aims to be nurturing and it will include some mindful art towards the end of the session. And for this, no experience is necessary at all and all you need is a piece of paper and a pencil. So whether you're watching us live or from the recording, I'd like to say a big thank you for joining us, including Bushra, who helped inspire us to run this event. Um, and a special thank you also to our speaking guests. Um, so I'd like to introduce uh, Tanaz Asefi, Valentina Dapril, Val Harding, Lucy Azaya, Jeanette Ma, Bushra, Lucy Murf Murphy, and last but not least, Zoe Tapper. But before we hear from our speakers, I'd like to start with an address uh, to mothers, which I first heard on Mother's Day, and I've adapted it for this event. To those who gave birth to their first child this year, we celebrate you. To those who lost a child this year, we mourn with you. To those who find great satisfaction and joy in motherhood, we rejoice with you. To those who are in the trenches with little ones, we are here for you. To those who have become both mum and teacher this year, we see you and we acknowledge your hard work. To those who have experienced loss through miscarriage or failed adoption, we mourn with you. To those who walk the hard path of infertility, filled with pokes, prods, tests, tears and disappointment, we walk with you. To those who are foster mums, we see your hard work and we need you. To those who have warm or close relationships with your children or grandchildren, we celebrate with you. To those who are missing your mums or grown up children due to distance or social isolation, we grieve with you. To those who have strange relationships or emotional distance with your children, we sit and we mourn with you. To those who have close and supportive relationships with your mum, we celebrate you and we acknowledge the gift that you have. To those who have lost your mothers, we grieve with you. To those who have experienced abuse or have difficult or toxic relationships with your mothers, we acknowledge your experience. To those who are without children and longing to be mothering, we mourn that life has not turned out the way you longed, it, you longed for it to be. To those who step parent, we see the blended family you've worked hard to create and we admire the role that you play in your child's life or children's lives. To those of you who are pregnant with new life, both expected and unexpected, we anticipate with you. To those who experience pain, anxiety, disappointment, loss, ill health, and medical complications in your family, we are here for you. And lastly, may we use this maternal mental health day event to honor all of the women in our lives who have loved us, shaped us, prayed for us, mentored us, guided us, and taught us, we see the valuable contribution you are. <laughs> I hope that was a nice starting point and just goes to show the diversity in motherhood. Um, so thank you for listening to that. Um, I'd love to invite Valentina to speak first, who is a mother, 
and the founder of De Delicioso. Thanks so much for coming, Valentina. Please take yourself off mute. Uh, I remember meeting you and your beautiful son at the creative uh, well-being events, I think it was a couple of years ago now, uh, and capturing some of your poetry to be used in a song that we were, were making at the time uh, that included the words panta ray, uh, which means, I believe it means everything flows. I think Tanaz is nodding because she remembers too. <laughs> I wonder if you could share a little bit about your journey uh, through motherhood and how these words, everything flows, uh, are meaningful to you. Yes. First of all, thank you so much for having me. It's a real honour. And what a beautiful uh, reading you've just read. It's uh, made me quite emotional. So mm -hmm. bear with me if a few tears come, come down. I always blame the hormones. It's always the hormones. Um, so I have three children, um, Leon, which is 11. I am a um, mum of an angel baby, which would have been five, nearly five. And mum um, to a toddler, two and a half year old, which is a volcano. Um, um, so my journey has been quite diverse and has been quite uh, uh, lots of ups and downs, like for all of us. Um, and Pantare, which, as you said, quite rightly, means um, everything flows, is something that stuck with me. It is one of the few things I remember from studying um, uh, the history of philosophy back then at school. It was the only concept that really resonated with me, um, because I think I always struggled a bit with, with mental health and with feeling stuck. And so that was, for me, the the word that, that would two words that would I could easily almost repeat like a mantra to say everything flows nothing stays the same everything passes and this too shall pass and so every time I feel stuck and I feel um, lonely I feel um, isolated um, then I think of Pantare and I remind myself nothing stays the same ever everything evolves just wait and see trust wait and see how this situation evolves. Um, and so this is true for motherhood, for life, for everything. So um, that's what helps me quite a lot. That's beautiful, Valentina. And a, really, and a great message to be sending out there to anyone who's feeling stuck at the moment. And it can yeah. be like that. It can feel, actually at the moment, like Groundhog Day, actually in lockdown. Uh, Absolutely. You know? Uh, there is, there is, there can be stuckness along. Absolutely, the and and, and and in lockdown, I felt particularly stuck, which is why I um, decided to create Delizioso, because I, I felt really lost. Uh, I felt there was a purpose for me, not just being a mum, which I, I love and I hate at the same time. Uh, I treasure and at the same time I loathe. Some moments I'm like. <laughs> you know and but, but they are the joy of my life but at the same time um, they drive me crazy but who would I be without them or I couldn't imagine my life without them mm -hmm. um, yeah. um, but I felt that there was more to me than than being a mum and I wanted I was I've always had this this feeling of nurture of serving of creating food making food to make people feel welcome and loved um, and so I've decided to come up with this um, sharing food boards uh, uh, and boxes for, for people and, and, and especially for mums I, I um, it's my greatest pleasure when people contact me and say oh, could you send this box a friend of mine has just become a mum and so I put all my love and all my positive yeah. intention to reach this so that the food could taste good and look good so that it reaches those mums and they can find some respite five minutes to just enjoy every mouthful and just mm. chill and, and sort of rest. Because I remember when I had, especially when I had my third, I was really, I felt really lonely. Um, mm. Once my mum and my sister had gone, 10 days after he was born, the hard work started. And, you know, I, I wanted food, I was hungry, but I couldn't really cook. I couldn't think about cooking. Um, so I think food is is is, is more than just um, nurture. It, it, you yeah. know, it, you know, there, there's a lot more to that. You know, taking care of someone, tell them I love you, and I do that with with food. So that is something that's helped me to get unstuck and mm -hmm. to um, have purpose beside my children, and brought 
a lot of joy that I needed. Sure. And you're completely right. It's not just the food, is it? It's the love and the kindness that's wrapped up in it. Yeah. Uh, in receiving it. That sounds really beautiful. Yes. And, um, I, and I bring me a lot of um, fulfillment. And sometimes I, while I'm creating, I'm like, oh, I love this. I, it, it gives me purpose. It gives me uh, uh, joy to know that this, this will make someone happy. Yeah. Um, and you know. I think uh, about all the meals that we make as mums you know yes. day in day out day yes. in day out and the children refuse most my, my children refuse yeah. a lot of the meals I make yeah, that's hard that's hard, <laughs> it is hard. <laughs> um and yet from mother to receive something it's really nurturing yeah. it sounds yeah. really nurturing and yeah. lots of kindness wrapped up in it in the way that it's you present yeah. it and I'm working with tanners to create cards to give to them as well with a little message with a beautiful artwork so that they can think Okay, I'm not on my own here. You know, um, you know, there's another mom that understands where I'm coming from. I love this bundle of joy. I love this baby, but I'm also really tired. I've had sleepless nights and I'm absolutely knackered. I don't know what I'm doing. I'm blagging most of the times. Where is that manual that, you know, that I'm looking for to, to know what to do? There isn't one, by the way. Yeah, um, <laughs> you're right there. Yeah, totally. Oh, thank you so much, Valentina, for sharing that. It's beautiful. I'd love to try some as well. Uh, I'll be in touch. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs> um, I'd like now to invite uh, Jeanette Ma to speak. Um, Jeanette is a mother and a life coach, coach, and I understand you've got a son and twin daughters. Um, I wonder if you could share something about your experience of motherhood. What's it been like for you? Um, well, I had um, a fairly um, rough journey <laughs> in the beginning years. Um, my son is now 14 and my daughter is 11, so I've had time to, to adjust to all the early years. Um, but I would say within the early years, my daughters, my daughters were born at 29 weeks, um, so spent a number um, eight weeks in the hospital initially. Um, and one of them contracted meningitis, which led to um, additional um, four weeks in the hospital and, and long-term kind of care. So their early years were pretty much spent going from hospital to hospital to hospital, um, saying that um, they have beat all expectations and they've been amazing. Um, but the early years were very much me trying to adjust to having twins, an older child, um, not having family in the same city or the same country, and, and also um, becoming an advocate for my children within the, the health system. And that was probably the hardest part of it was it was making sure that each of my three children that had various health ch challenges were getting the care that they needed. So um, looking back, I have to say for me, I don't really remember the first few years. <laughs> um, and I mean, I was very lucky that I had friends, you know, the idea of the food box is amazing because I did have friends, particularly when I had the twins who would bring food to me um, who would visit me when they were in the hospital, when the girls were first born, or even when my daughter had meningitis, they would bring food in to make sure that I had what I needed, um, take my son and care for him, which was amazing help to have. And, um, and I also made sure that I kept active for myself. So trying to take care of myself as best I could, uh, and, that is, I would run. There's a lot of amazing running groups that were around, and I did that. And and dancing and music were kind of my ways of releasing releasing stress. Um, so I have had the journey, and I've also um, because my daughters were premature, they landed in a different year group than they might have been otherwise. They were born at the end of August, and they were supposed to be born in November. Mm -hmm. So I also then become part of a group to, to ensure that they could start in reception at the age of five. And that was a whole different journey. But um, so I've, I've sure. learned a lot about working the systems of education and, and the national health system. Jeanette, that takes a lot of courage 
and I can imagine it's um, very demanding, you know, to be, and, and you're completely right. We need, we all need to be, an, be advocates for our children, don't we? Yes. And it's not always easy. You know, some things are, are straightforward, actually. Some things are, and they're, they're already set up. But when you realize actually that, you know, this particular system doesn't cater for our child's experience or condition, there's a lot, it, it sounds like you've had to put in a lot of work, you've had success, but I can imagine it's taken a lot of your time and effort to get there. Yes, yeah. it, it, it was that. I think at the time, I wasn't necessarily thinking about it, I was doing it. <laughs> and then once it was done, I did have to deal with a lot of my own kind of um, mental health challenges with ensuring that, you know, I was okay. And that has been my journey. And that's why I ended up following and going into life coaching and Can working with women. Um, well, I work with women to try to help them, to give them a voice. And a lot of the work is working on embodying some of the energies and taking care of themselves and definitely just learning to, to enjoy life again, feel pleasure, and mm. uh, to learn to just see the world, that gratitude and see what they bring to the world. Um, I felt really lost, even though I had done all that for my daughters. I It took a while for me to start seeing the world in color again. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I'd like to do, is I help give them a voice mm -hmm. and help guide them and share with them and and help them to, to be more powerful. Empowerment. That sounds yes. really inspiring, Jeanette. What a great thing you're doing uh, in helping these other women. And you mentioned about that pent up feeling, you know, and it sounds mm -hmm. like you went on, in, you got yourself into running clubs and, and dance as a way of releasing it. And I wonder for any woman who, you know, who you, um, who, any mother who comes to you who might feel frustrated and, you know, that pent up uh, frustration and stress, uh, what is it uh, that you would you know what words or, or what would you do to help um well one of the early things is to to work with women is realizing that a lot of women don't know in their bodies i know we have children mm -hmm. but we don't actually recognize the signs that our bodies are given uh, giving us and so a lot of the work is about recognizing when are you feeling frustrated what does that feel like and how do you shift that in your body how do you shift that in your mood and um, so it might be with, for me, I love music. So it's finding that music and to move my body and to recognize that. And also working with women to see what they have really accomplished. Mm -hmm. And I think that's with gratitude. Um, I do some work with talking about your wins. Where are you today? And what was your win for today? And maybe that was, I got up. And then I went back to bed and that is a great win. It's recognizing what you need and taking care of yourself and I'm, giving, and giving, sorry, and giving women permission to do that because we're so busy taking care of others. We forget to take care of ourselves. I think that I'm sure that resonates with many moms. It's a really great thing to remember. And Jeanette, it sounds really, really, really important the work that you do with the body and especially in lockdown I'm sure that most of us have found ourselves on zoom screens in zoom rooms a lot like we are now and it can be quite a, actually quite a disembodying experience because we just I don't know if anyone is old enough to remember celebrity squares but you know it's that kind of experience and and the rest of the body can can be lost can't it, mm. it can be forgotten about so just bringing awareness to the body and and uh, acknowledging the body as a source of wisdom sounds really, really uh, wise and inspiring. Yes. Yeah. Thank that you. is. Oh, no, thank you. No, I was going to say that is. It's getting in there, really feeling and trusting our intuition, trusting what we think is right. Yes. I like that because, of course, we all have our logical thinking, don't we? What's very cognitive. And our intuition is like it's a way of kind of almost bringing together what we think rationally, but also not forgetting our intuition, which gives us so much wisdom. Yeah. Oh, that resonates with me. <laughs> Thank you so much, Jeanette, for talking uh, talking with us. Um, I'd now like to invite Lucy Murphy to talk, who is a befriender at the Her Centre. 
and a general manager of the Bridge Community Centre. Hi, Lucy. Hello. <laughs> I wonder if you could share a little bit about your story. Um, yeah, and uh, your journey through motherhood. Yeah, so I've uh, got two daughters who are nine and five. I'm also a stepmom to two older children who are 22 and 17, um, who I do have a wonderful relationship with, but obviously it's, it's had its, you know, that's been a roller coaster. Um, kind of blending it all together has been quite challenging, but it's, um, it's worked out for the best. Um, I mean, motherhood has been the happiest, saddest, most exciting, loneliest, terrifying, amazing experience that has just sent, you know, and it's everything all at once, isn't it? And it's incredibly overwhelming um, and a lot of guilt, guilt because you want a break then you feel bad because that means you don't love them. Guilt because you want to go out, but then what will happen to your baby if you go out, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> Basically, just a lot of guilt. Um, and, I mean, I've always been an anxious person, but, I mean, being pregnant and having children just kicked it into overdrive, really. So I spent the majority of the first few years just being terrified all the time about absolutely everything. <laughs> um, uh, yes. Which, yeah. And I, th I think, actually, that connects with, um, a lot of mums, you know, I think a lot of mums would resonate with that, that, that anxiety and, and the thoughts, you know, becoming so huge in the mind, wondering, you know, what if, um, um, you know, am I getting it right? Uh, all these huge thoughts, you know, should I be doing this? I should have done that. Um, they're huge, aren't they? Uh, mm. And very, that very weighty feeling. And um, also just so lonely as well, just sitting at home all day thinking gosh, this is actually really boring, but then feeling quite guilty about the fact that you're really bored <laughs> mm. because your brain just, you have nothing to occupy your brain, um, which is kind of how I started in my um, path with the bridge, really, um, mm. because I started volunteering then when my oldest was a year old, just because I just needed to meet people. I didn't know anybody gone. You know, you, do, you go from working full time with a social life to being at home with a baby, husband works away on my own in the week with the with a little baby you never slept you know that kind of thing and you just need I just needed to see grown-ups and talk to them so I started volunteering there and eventually now after having another daughter and I was it nine years later eight years later I'm now the manager um Amazing. so and one of the things I kind of wanted to do with that is just give that lifeline to other mums um make them realize that there is a safe space they can come to even if you know, they're still in their pyjama bottoms or they haven't slept and they just, and, you know, outside of COVID, obviously, we'll hold the baby for you. We'll make you a cup of tea um, and realise that everything you're feeling is completely normal. And actually, we're all in the same. We all feel exactly the same. We all, we all doubt ourselves. We all challenge what we're doing constantly. Um, and just that solidarity. Um, I think, you know, we can't underestimate the power of just talking to other women about their experiences um, and how, how kind of therapeutic that can actually be. Um, so, I mean, obviously during COVID, we had to, we had to shut down. Um, and I remember just sitting there thinking, similarly to Valentina actually, I can't just sit here and not do anything because there must be so many mums. And I'd had a long-standing relationship with the Her Centre anyway, um, who were doing all of this that we've done, but with, escaping domestic violence with no finances to buy their food for their kids um mm. you know mental health problems anxiety all these things so um kind of started collecting food parcels from my neighbors um and from local supermarkets and delivering them to the her center um to distribute among their mums really and then I used to kind of drive them around and deliver them to people oh. um, just because I wanted everybody all the, all the mums to make them to kind of feel that they weren't on their own that somebody actually did care about them yeah um, what a beautiful gift Lucy and I think what I'm really getting from that is that sense of isolation and you working so hard to reduce that and as you say to normalize those feelings uh, because there's nothing more isolating or lonely thinking this is it's just me mm. it's just me yeah uh, so I mean We've started a baby yeah. group recently to, for mums who've had babies during lockdown. And, you know, we've, they're coming in, I mean, they're coming in and it's just like, we haven't spoke, you know, our babies haven't seen another baby. Mm -hmm. 
we mm-hmm. haven't spoken to another mum. We've just been in the house, we, you know, and it's so, and they're just, just enjoying chatting to each other. And it's so nice because if that just makes one person feel a little bit better that day, then it's done a good thing, isn't it? Absolutely. And as you say, if you're just with your baby all day and not having that adult interaction, it can be boring, and, you know. <laughs> uh, it's not awful saying that, but it is actually like you're a bit bonkers, don't you? Yeah, it's, it's <laughs> important to have that balance, isn't it? Mm, be able yeah. to spend time with the baby and also do something nurturing for you, to, you know, for someone to talk to someone who can speak fluent <laughs> the, the same language <laughs> as you, not just baby talk, you know. Yeah, Someone you don't need to do anything for. Yeah, <laughs> that sounds that sounds really, really nurturing and so important to make these connections. And, and mm. what a great gift you've given those mums to set that up. Oh, thank thank you. you. Yeah, thanks so much, Lucy, for joining us. I'd now like to invite Zoe Tapper to talk, who is a mother, an actress and an ambassador for Mums Aid. Thanks so much for joining us, Zoe. Oh, thank you for having me. I'm really <sighs> pleased to be here and um I already resonate with so much that's already been said. Um, so it's, uh, it's, it's always a pleasure to kind of speak with people who get it. <laughs> and, um, and as long as you're honest, um, most of the time, mums do get it because they've all been there. Oh, totally. Um, Zoe, I asked you if you might, um, would you, if you would mind sharing with us a poem that might that resonated with you and you've been very kind and agreeing and I wondered if you might be able to share that with us now yeah um it's actually not a poem if that's all oh, right that's it's, fine an extract um, it's it's from a, a book that I've read um quite recently actually called um what have I done which is quite a good title <laughs> beautiful read and it's a really honest read and it's a, it's a story about it's a true story about a woman um Laura Dockrill who had um her baby and had really terrible postnatal depression and actually it then um turned into psychosis actually so she had a terrifying time and she ended up in a mother and baby unit for a long time and was very poorly but she's written with um yeah a lot of honesty and a lot of um and actually a lot of comedy as well it's quite a funny book it's quite um and it's very heartwarming and very moving. And it and it resonated with me hugely because I had postnatal depression after both my children. Um, I think before I, I will definitely I just want to say a little bit um, about my children that I I think the, what Lucy was saying about was is huge part of how I look in those early days of motherhood I I constantly felt like a failure I constantly felt like I had not done what I should be doing or I was failing my children or I was failing my husband or everybody else knew more than me or could do it better than me or could cope better than me and um it it took me a long time I suppose to give myself allow myself to see it as an illness rather than thing that I was failing at and I think in a funny sort of way even though I didn't it was horrible to kind of go through it a second time with my second um child it sort of reaffirmed that because I thought you know the second time around the first time around I was so I felt like I was so prepared and then it hit me like a you know meteorite and I felt I completely collapsed and I completely it was a complete zombie and I completely you know just dropped everything and and just and didn't cope at all um, and then when I recovered I sort of shut it all down and hoped that I'd never have to think about it again and never have to talk about it again and of course these things never really go away do they if you don't deal with them and if you don't talk about them then they they eventually find a way of surfacing and so I I struggled for a while in between the two children and then when we went for a second child I was told by actually medical professionals as well oh it's very unlikely you'll have it again it's uh it's normally something that new mothers get um and I did I had it all over again and and just as badly but I suppose the second time around I had I knew that it would get better, even though it was awful. I knew eventually I would come out of it. Um, and so I suppose that leads me into this um, this book. And there's two sort of little sections that sort of work well together. And um, she she talks, she calls it a sort of little subtitle called Some Truths About Postpartum Illness. So 
A lot of people, when they hear you have become unwell after your pregnancy, respond with, was it your first baby? As if you were just so overwhelmed with your new role that you just simply couldn't manage and lost the plot. Postpartum illness is not the result of not being able to cope with a newborn or new motherhood. I know mothers who have experienced maternal mental illness on their second, third or even fifth child. Postpartum illness is not triggered because the reality of life with a new baby didn't meet your rose-tinted Hollywood expectations, nor is it caused by being envious of social media mums. Yes, social media can exacerbate the anxiety, stress and feelings of inferiority, but you don't develop a serious mental illness because you are jealous. Postpartum illness is not caused by being stressed and busy during pregnancy. A postpartum illness can happen to anybody for any reason. Yes, stress doesn't help, but when does added stress help anybody at any time, ever? It does not mean you fail. It does not make you a bad mum. It's uncomfortable, but it's true. It is a painfully long waiting game. You will not feel like this forever. You will be happy again. You will love again. You will throw your head back and crack up laughing again. You will hold hands again. You will sleep again. You will cry at a film again. You will go for a drink with your friends in a sunny beer garden again. You will go on holiday. You will enjoy the seasons. You will get your hair cut. This all seems quite familiar to lockdown, actually, doesn't it? Um, you will go shopping. You will see your friends. You will have a party. You will go to work. You will kiss. You will have ideas. You will run. You will be able to buy a sandwich from a shop. You will be able to fill out a form. You will be able to enjoy a meal at a restaurant. You will feel happy for no reason. You will feel safe. You will be able to think of other things beside your Ill besides your illness and your fears. You will get your relationships back. You will feel like you. You are just around the corner. I know you don't believe it. I know you don't believe me, but you are. You're waiting. I thought that was so, it, it really resonated. So moving. Because it's, I think, ever since those experiences, I think the first when I, I when I sort of went through the age of it all the process and you know my eldest is now 10 years so it's it happened a while ago now all of that but when I first went through it that that sense of wanting to pretend it hadn't happened and not really talk about it and cover it up and get on, on with it um so real and when I was confronted with it again I just thought I can't pretend anymore. And 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 because I'd then sort of um, made these links with Miriam at Mum's Aid and I'd, I'd sort of started to have a lot more mum friends. We'd started talking and a very close friend, a very close friend of mine actually suffered terribly from postnatal depression as well. And we suddenly just went, hang on, so many people go through this. Mm. And it's yet another way that women are silenced if we just feel like we have to pretend it hasn't happened or we don't talk about our trauma or we um we just kind of brush everything under the carpet and so I think more than anything now um the two messages that I always feel like I want to say to new mums is that it's it's okay to feel whatever you're feeling even if those things aren't um necessarily that palatable and and also it will get better whatever you're feeling now it it it, it can change and it will change and it might take a long time and it might take a little bit of a struggle, but it will be okay in the end. And I think that sort of message of hope is so important to relate to people. Oh, thanks so much, Zoe. That was really moving. I loved um, what you were saying about just breaking down barriers um, and knowing that, you know, honouring the feelings that you have and knowing that you're not alone. Uh, in the passage, you also talked, the, 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 the passage said, I know you won't believe me, but, you know, and, and sometimes it's about someone else, you know, even if mums can't hold on to the hope themselves, um, getting somebody else else's support and for them to hold on to the support for you, you know. And going back to what Valentina was saying, Pantare, you know, everything changes everything flows you will come out of this even if it feels like you're just stuck yes thank you so much that was really moving thank you, thank you. Uh, I'd now like uh, to invite Val Harding to speak who is a former mum's aid counsellor and has experience of not only being a mother but also a grandmother hi Val hi 
Thanks Hello. so much for joining us. Yeah. Um, I just wondered if you could tell us a little bit about what you've learned about the maternal experience in becoming a grandmother. Well, first of all, I'd love to say how much the, this, this evening is really listening to everybody speaking is very inspiring and it's really lovely to hear everyone's stories. Um, I think that actually learning about the maternal experience as a grandmother is that, in fact, being a grandparent is is part of the maternal experience itself it you know when when you when you first have children the thought that one day you might be a grandmother is miles away that's not something you're going to think about at all <laughs> but when the time comes it's like it it's that you you relive some of that experience um and I think that, um, there, uh, first of all, let me say as well, I have two grandchildren, a four-year-old grandson and one and a half-year-old granddaughter. And they're both children of my son. And I think quite possibly grandparenting can be a different experience depending on whether it's your son or your daughter's children. You know, I think it's different relationships. But, but one of the things that we've always think is very important as counsellors at Mum's Aid is, is what is happening with everybody's own mothers. You know, and of course, there's a huge variety of relationships. People might be near or far away, or the relationship with mothers can, be, can vary enormously. Um, but that relationship is very crucial and, and very important in, in the whole process. Yeah. And um, so I'm really aware of that, and um, and and I try I try to think about that as a grandmother, and I think that um, one of the parallels I think very about is that is is that about feeling that you're good enough, mm -hmm. and this is another theme that I think we all uh, follow and and. Um, is is are we good enough as parents are we are we doing the right things and the, there's a parallel of being a grandparent you can wonder the same thing and and um you can go through the same the same feelings about um you know are, are you being good enough and i think there are you know our society has actually does have strong expectations of grandparents you know and um I think I soon discovered as a grandparent that I wasn't going to keep up with all the knitting that some people do. <laughs> that was not for me. <laughs> but <laughs> but during during lockdown, which was really, really hard because, you know, my, my son lives outside London. So, of course, we, we weren't seeing our grandchildren. Um, so um, during lockdown... I held weekly sing-song sessions over Zoom with my grandchildren. But, oh. And that was lovely. That was lovely. And, and not only with them, but also with uh, the children of my, my niece's children as well, two, two children. Um, but that was lovely and, until my grandson decided he hated Zoom and hid under the sofa. So that was the end <laughs> of that. <laughs> oh. So then I started drawing him pictures and sending them in the post. And um, so, you know, so they, so all, all the time there's been, you know, been trying to maintain the relationship with them. And of course, my and of course, I saw a lot more of him before lockdown than my granddaughter. So um, so now there's a whole catching up to do with. Of with course. Her. Of course, it sounds like you found some really creative ideas and if singing didn't work, then you tried something else. <laughs> yeah, and it's been like that, hasn't it, through lockdown, just thinking of other ways to connect. Other ways. Um, to, yeah, yeah. yeah. But, um, but one, one thing that I, I would say, one thing I've really learned as a counsellor working with, 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 with all the mums that I've worked with at Mums Aid is that... As a, as a mother, you, you need to let, this is a message I'd give to grandmothers, you need to let 
your children do that parenting in their own way you know because I've, I've quite often heard people describe intergenerational difficulties you know conflicts about discipline potty training this that and the other and and I think it's a really important as a grandparent to to let your children bring up their children as they want to you're there to be as supportive as possible um, and and to and to be to be that to be engaged and 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 be there for them but but not to interfere <laughs> thank you so much for that message Val and that, that seems to be con- connected to that fear of not being good enough you know if a mother's yeah, experiencing that and then they hear from a grandmother or grandfather shouldn't you be doing it this way you know that kind of tone then does that help or hinder it possibly Absolutely. hinders doesn't it yeah yeah well it does it does hinder and I, I've yeah. heard I've heard a lot of mums say that over the mm. years yeah and, and, and I think um and I know from my own from bringing up my own children you know I didn't want to hear some <laughs> of the things <laughs> my yes. own mother had to say <laughs> well thank you so much for your um yeah for your for your talking to us about that maternal experience from a grandmother perspective and also for your pearls of wisdom as well bringing into the conversation that very familiar topic am i good enough you know um and and ways to bolster mums lift them up uh, and encourage them and let them give them the space to do it their way because there are so many different ways to do it right aren't there yes yes yeah thank you so much i'd now like to invite lucy isaiah to talk hi lucy lucy's a mum a designer and the founder of black female entrepreneur greenwich (laughs) hi nice to see you i wonder if i could ask you what your experience uh, of being a mum is what's your journey been like very challenging, very, very challenging. But at the end, that has actually what make me who I am today. Mm. So if that's not been challenging, maybe I won't be the mom that I am today. So I have, I have three children, 14, 11, and, and eight, going to nine. Sometimes you forget their age. <laughs> so, and then... Um, as an African mom, as a migrant, and I know there's a lot of people who are going through my, who, have, who is going through my challenge at the moment as we speak, and some that has actually come out of it, and some that will soon be going into it because they are single, getting married, or they are pregnant. Um, England is a great place. Western world is a great place. But for a lot of us and some, as a migrant, it's a very challenging um place because um back home you have a village to support you you have your neighbor even though they even though they help come with a bit of um stream attached but you still have people to support you but in here there's no one and it sounds like an isolating experience bringing a lot of memory to me Mm. Very challenging, and um, I'll give a, a big kudos to Miriam. <laughs> Miriam, Dawn, and Nessa. I call them my Bermuda Triangle. <laughs> they, um, sorry. Um, having been pregnant, having children, going through professionals. You know, I have to learn to be a professional mom and I have to learn to let people know that even though I'm dyslexic, even though I don't have the kind of qualification they have, but just being a mom, I'm a professional. So, Lucy, I I love that because when um, when women are asked, what do you do? Um, It's a really interesting question, isn't it? What do you do? And in my experience, some moms have said, I'm, uh, I don't, I'm, I'm a mum. <laughs> and yet, that's what they're, they're doing. Profes- I like that. I like that take on it, Lucy. Yeah, I'm a yeah. professional mum. Yeah. You're a professional mum because I see every child as a level of degree in the university. Because mm. every child have different experience, 
you have to learn to, every pregnancy have different experience. Every pregnancy have different midwife that you have. Sometimes you meet the same midwife, but not the same doctor that will deliver the child. So, and not the same professionals that you meet along the road. So you meet different people. So you need to have that skill to be able to manage this professional, able to manage. And every time you have pregnancy, there are different hardship that come with it. Uh, there are different challenges that come with it. There are different illness that come with it. So um, some, there's no one that will tell me being a mom is not professional work. It is a professional work because he comes with a lot of um, challenges that you need this. You, you don't need to go to, no matter the amount of university you go to, you cannot, you cannot have a degree to be a mom, you know? You, it has to come naturally. It has to come as how your body can manage and take it and go along with it. So, and that is why I feel every mother has is gifted. You're gifted in your own way for you to be able to manage that situation. And after, and also, I was listening to so who was the person talking about? I think it was Jeanette talking about dealing, then have to manage with telling the professional that I know my child mm -hmm. has a problem, my child has a need. My older son just got diagnosed now with uh, um, autistic spectrum. But this is something I've been fighting. Mm -hmm. I have been fighting for since he was two. You know, now I have to do it privately to, he's still on the waiting list, but we've already got the results. We have to go through private. But I'm privileged that I was able to do that privately. But there's a lot of parents out there that fight yeah. And this is what actually affects our mental health, that you have to deal with this profession. I call it professional cutting. Every stage is you have this professional cutting different. You try to take one out, another one is coming. You're pushing it, more is coming. It's like you're going through a tunnel of fabric and mm -hmm. you don't know how to unwrap those fabric, you know? So it, it's, it's, it's a challenging, but I would say those challenge actually has acquired me some degree of BSc or master's. And as I come through each one of them, I beginning to study people. I become a, uh, a psychology myself. So <laughs> beginning to understand who, who they are, how people is, how do I have to manage myself? How do I have, I have to say something to myself, you know, I am not going to allow you to take the better part of me. I'm a professional mom and I'm gonna sit here as a professional mom. I know Mary, I used to say that thing, Lucy has to be on your terms and condition. And that's what I, I, I say to them. If it's not on my terms and condition, I'm walking away. Whenever you are ready, we can have that conversation. Yes, I am, I might, you might see me, you might have read my file that I have some emotional breakdown, but it's people like you that actually make me to have emotional breakdown. So I'm gonna walk away when you two have your five minutes of madness and we can actually come back and have a conversation. But it has been a very challenging one that has actually made me a stronger woman. And I love, I love reading the African proverb because that has what has kept me. There's a lot of meaning to African proverb and also uh, people like um, Maya Angelo and Madam CJ Walker, this are uh -huh. yes, 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 beautiful, so, beautiful authors. Yes. So these are some of these inspirational books and um, poetry. That I love poetry because um, I write a lot of poetry. I have yeah. uh, so every situation in my life, I write a poetry about it. Oh, wonderful! Yes. At the next event, Lucy, perhaps you can share some of your poetry with us. And yeah. um, and what you're saying has also reminded me. You know, nothing is wasted. Nothing yeah. is wasted. All the all the all the um, pain, the loss, all the challenges make you the mothers and the women that you are today. Yeah, definitely. Because yeah. Um, every every people every there's something my mom said to me when I was growing up. You said that a, that anybody you come across, there's a purpose for that person. Do not let anything around you deprive you of that purpose. Yeah. And that that is what has kept me going. Any oh. meet with anyone, any relationship, anyone I come across, how big, how small, I just try to achieve the reason why I, I believe there's a purpose why I meet them. 
So I try to make sure that I, I take advantage of that. Yeah. And that is what has given me all the skills. When I went to the children's center as a volunteer and um, any courses that they put on my table, I just go for it. Uh, no matter how challenging, I just go. And I learned how to become a fashion designer at the children's center. Look at me now. I have over Beautiful. I have over 50 sewing machines. I'm running <laughs> classes. I'm doing this. But I started like this migrant that has nothing, that had problem with immigration, that, that don't have anywhere to go to, don't have money. I couldn't feed. I couldn't pay my rent. I couldn't feed my children. But I have, it, it has been a journey. And, and that is yeah. why I am helping. That is why I'm out there. Just want yeah. to help somebody because a lot of people, people have helped me and, and I have just taken every opportunity. There's no opportunity that I've just allowed it to go. Mm. I just take it on, on the chin. Thank you so much for sharing those inspiring words and your amazing story and your journey you know, through life and through motherhood. Thank you so much. I really appreciated that and I'm sure everyone did. Um, I wonder if I could move on to Bushra Bati, um, who's in the Zoom room. Hi, Bushra. Hello. Um, Bushra is a mum and a teaching as associate, I think. Assistant. Uh, assistant, sorry, a teaching assistant. And also from a media Muslim Women's Association. I believe you've got something to share with us. Yes. Um, I'm listening to the inspiring um, stories of all moms. And I just came out uh, with a little poem. Um, every single mother is gone through a process. And uh, keeping that in mind, you know, uh, I just came out of a little poem and a piece of art I want to share. Um, and also I want to share one more thing. Um, belonging to a faith group, Ahmadiyya Muslim community, we always learn that being mother is the most important part, the most important role, because you are not just mothers, you are nation builders. So mm -hmm. that's very important as, uh, uh, you know, the, um, the speaker uh, prior to me said, she's a professional mom. We all are professionals. We are nation builders. So be proud to be, to be mother. And um, I just uh, want to share this poem with you. A mother is made through all these processes, motivation to go out of comfort zones with tolerance and humble and honest efforts of empathy and self-encouragement to become a role model. So mothers are role models for the next generation, for the um, other mothers, you know, around us, that's so important. And keeping this in mind, you know, in our, uh, in my language, Urdu, um, that's how we write the word mother, which is pronouncing as Ami. We say Ami to mother. And I put this writing into an art piece. I'm not an artist, I tried last night and here I got um, an island with the same word, a mother oh, who yes. can, you know, uh, again, uh, belong to um, Islam. You know, we have, uh, we have heard since childhood uh, a saying of our Holy Prophet that paradise lies under the feet of your mother. So pa mothers have the potential to make paradise for the society or to make a hell for the society, you know, how you nurture your children. So in that picture, it's like, you know, mother's gone through so many challenges and how they can save their children in their lap and how secure the children feel in their lap. So it's like a little garden in the lap. They can learn, they can flourish and um, they can feel safe. So I, I, I think you can recognize, you know, the same as in Urdu. I just put that word into an art. I'm not an artist. I just. That's, I just so, that's so clever. I love how you've done that. <laughs> Thank you so much. That's such a gift, Bushra, to share with us your poem and your art. 
Thank you and, so and, much for the opportunity. <laughs> Thanks a lot. <laughs> thank you. And um, just remembering, just Umi, I think, I'm so pleased you've, you've taught us that word. Um, and just to think about us as nation builders. Gosh, it's almost taken my breath away. Yes. In, in, my, uh, in Urdu, it is said Ami, and in oh, Arabic, Ami. it's Ami, and it's Arabic, it's Umi. So it is written in the same way, the same essence. And I'm I sure, see. you know, the p- mothers have so much in common. So we are all nation builders. Be proud of yourself. Mm, thank you so much. <gasps> Um, so finally, I'd like to invite Tanaz Asefi to speak. Hi, Tanaz. Thank you so much for agreeing to lead us in a nurturing activity. But before you do this, please, could you tell us a little bit about yourself and perhaps also about how art is important to you? Because you're, art- you're a mum and you're an artist and you're a group facilitator for Mums Aid. Yes, I, I, I am an artist. Uh, art has been my thing throughout my life. Um, and then I moved here to study further. I'm from Iran, so I, I moved to uh, London to study further. And it was a difficult journey, you know, adjusting to all the changes. As Lucy was saying, you know, feeling suddenly isolated and, you know, having no support. Uh, everything was different. Friendships was different. Everything was different. And I was not prepared for it. Um, And then I met my husband and um, I had my son. It was a challenging pregnancy, very challenging. And he was born uh, prematurely. And the first 48 hours, they were not sure if he will survive. And I think that that sense of I might lose him um, kind of put me in a space that I stopped thinking about me. It wasn't about me. It was just about him. So when I go back, I kind of think that I had experienced postnatal depression, but it wasn't diagnosed at all. It wasn't picked up, um, not even by myself or people around me or any professionals, because I had this big smile on my face, maybe. Um, Just everything's fine. Everything's fine because he was doing well. Um, but it was a very challenging experience. Of course, the joys um, was what help, helps us to carry on. But it was very challenging and I felt very lonely because I didn't have the support I needed from my husband, from people around me. Um, it was very difficult. And the fact that, you know, with that experience, my husband didn't want another child. So again, I, I had to kind of deal with that as well, like a grief of not being able to have a full term pregnancy or to have another baby and see maybe that would be easier, all of that. And three years after my son was born, I lost my dad and that grief completely um, I think combined with the postnatal depression and grief of not having another child, all of that, it just expressed itself through losing my dad. And I went into this deep, deep um, grief process that I just couldn't function. Um, I remember I couldn't breathe. I couldn't cry even. It was so huge that I just couldn't. The only thing I could do was to grab some ink and just draw and paint my pain. And it was all black ink, black ink, you know, all red, spots of red. And reading poetry because I was looking for the words, finding the words to express how I was feeling, how intense that I didn't have the words myself for it. And then gradually, you know, doing that, and my son got a bit older, and he started school, he went into a good school, so all of that helped me to give me some space to deal with the grief. Um, And, um, you know, I had some money um, coming to me from inheritance, and I rented a studio, a very tiny studio, not this one, and I thought, I don't care about making money, I don't care about if this art is going to take me anywhere it just I have to do it otherwise you know something bad will happen to me and then my son will have have no one um so 
What I do with mums now, it stems from my experience that anyone can draw, anyone can paint, anyone can express. So I love what Bushra did and um, the fact that she kept saying, I, I don't know how to paint, I'm not an artist. But she is, I mean, we all saw, it's a beautiful piece. Um, so that's what I do with, um, you know, mums who join me every Saturday. Uh, we have a theme, so we discuss it. And then all of us in our own space on Zoom, I don't teach anybody how to draw anything, it's just observing things. And the act of observing and just putting some pen to paper helps the hand and eye coordination. And um, we take it from there, you know, by coloring in, by adding patterns, um, by changing it. And, you know, the conversations is just wonderful, so inspiring. The other week, I was um, not well, so I had to run the session. So um, I went and I did say I'm not well. I had a massive headache. Um, and, you know, all the ideas that poured in kind of lifted my spirit up. <laughs> So by the end of the session, I didn't have a headache. <laughs> so I was like, hey, ladies, this time it was your energy that helped me, you know, to kind of regain my energy. Um, and I think this, this coming together, this sisterhood, is just a huge part of it. But I see you. I see your headache, you know, today. I see your pain. And maybe I can say something to lift you up. And I think that's what what priceless value this coming together to support each other um, and you know my husband sometimes mocks and say oh it's all about the mum it's all about the mum i don't believe it's all about the mum of course fathers play a big role as well but it's all about us supporting each other women supporting each other through the sisterhood to just to acknowledge i see you you know yeah. i see your joy i see your challenge as well and just to do that. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing that. That was really beautiful, Tanaz. I wonder, um, because we're coming to a, the end of our event now, whether you might be able to, to give us a flavour of something that you do in your session. Um, maybe it can be f four or five minutes, if that's all right for yeah, everybody. Sure, sure. Um, Absolutely. Hopefully, um, hopefully you've got your piece of, piece of paper and pencil. And you can yeah, that's all you need. Partners. All you need is a um, piece of paper and pencil. And I think the easiest thing that we always have, and it's a good reminder for gratitude, um, to look at our hands. So I would like you to take the time to really look at your hand. You know, the shape of your fingers, your fingernails, um, all the, all the, and then just with one hand feel your other hand you know the softness of it is it cold is it warm is it bony is it soft just really take the time to look at it um, the shape of your fingers against one another all the lines inside the palm of your hand And then just place your hand onto your paper and draw around it like we used to do as children. As simple as that, you know, nothing, nothing. I don't know if you can see anything. It's really faint, but really simple. Just round your hand. And then place your non-dominant hand, pick up your pencil with your non-dominant hand and put your dominant hand somewhere else on your paper and draw around it. And try to really feel how the difference is with the dominant hand going around your fingers and non-dominant hand. It feels completely different. And the lines are different. So, so I did like two hands coming together, but you can place it anywhere you like.
And now you can just go over the lines you made and just make them drawing more visible. And while doing that, just think what your hands do for you day to day, for yourself, for your family, all the big things and little things your hands do. Um, from writing to washing, to caressing your child, to ironing their clothes. And if you like, you can write them down onto the hands and just uh, express some gratitude. Our body does a lot for us and we often take them for granted. I broke, I broke my elbow about a year and a half ago and that made me realize this exercise uh, really and how much it was my dominant hand. So um, my right hand didn't work and I had to use my left hand. And it just, that shift made me think um, how much <laughs> I have used my right hand. <laughs> so my right hand went into protest. I, when I was, when I'm doing it to nerds, I put, I, I did my first um, outline and then I did my other outline on top and it felt really quite nurturing actually. Mm. Like the other hand, I was touching my other hand in that way. Yeah, we rarely use our dominant, non-dominant hand, you know. So it's, it's it for me, it's really liberating to allow the non-dominant hand do what it likes and not to engage that it's not perfect, you know. It's just definitely and, and yeah. acknowledging everything our hands do for us because a lot of it's automatic. And yeah, we forget. At least I forget. <laughs> and so to remember, and and also to think about the things. Were, that our hands do for our children and others, but also what our hands do for us. Maybe it's running a, a nice warm bath or brushing your hair. And I mean, my elbow broken, with not majorly, it was like um, fractured and it was misaligned a bit, but I couldn't even put my socks on. I mean, the simplest thing, I couldn't brush my hair. Um, so I couldn't tie back my hair, you know, my husband had to do it for a couple of the first couple of days and it was bizarre, like what? I can't even do it. I couldn't do anything, you know, it was just really eye-opening. So if you like in your own time, you can color it in. I think it's a really nice exercise to add color or do the writing in color and just place it somewhere that you can see maybe for a couple of days as a reminder. I think it's a really beautiful keepsake for this event, Naz. Thank you so much um, My pleasure. for offering that. It's a real gift. Um, and to all of you, thank you so much for being part of Mum's Age Tribute to Mother's event. I hope you've enjoyed being part of it. Um, I'd like to say a big thank you to all of our speakers for being, you know, so, so wonderful in what you've shared. And... Um, I'd also like to thank our audience, uh, both live and who are listening to the recording of this. And to say to them, if you've been moved or affected by any of the discussion you've had or you want to learn more about counselling or weekly maternal well-being groups on offer, we invite you to get in touch with us at Mums Aid. Uh, and you can do this by visiting our website or emailing uh, info at mums-aid.org. But a big thank you again to everyone and goodbye.